And we are here for part two of the Kenobi discussion show. And this is actually talking about the third episode of Kenobi because they dropped two episodes of us in one go, which I'm very happy that they did. Uh, but me and Megan spoke about that at nauseam at the last episode. And Megan has joined me once again. We've got five people on this podcast. So myself, the lovely Megan. Hello. You know what Megan sounds like. Everyone always gets very excited <laughs> whenever she's on a show. More than even me now. I think people just listen to me, so they just have the chance of listening to Megan. Um, and we're also joined by Rhea Carrigan. Say hello to the masses, Rhea. Hello, masses. How are you all? They can't answer, Rhea. Don't be silly. No, no, uh, but she's nice. <laughs> you want to be a nice mic? Oh, look at who's the cunt in the room. <laughs> Dropping the C-bomb within minutes of Kenobi. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Nicely really done, done. Like nicely done. Few, few well, I appreciate, I appreciate the passion there. That's what we want. We want sorry. the passion, uh, the positive passion. And we've also joined by... Um, not quite the podfather. Let's call him the step uncle of the podcast network, <laughs> Chris Phelps. How are you doing, Chris? I don't know about Creepy that, Mike. Uncle. I want to take my name back. I want to be the podfather. I'm the elusive podfather. That does not sound good. Being an no, elusive father sounds really yeah. creepy, like you're hiding in cupboards. And no, but what it is, I'm the clever one because Dave does all the work. No one's blaming I'm... that. No, no, <laughs> you don't come across that way, Chris. No, let's be no. honest. Oh. Mike, no, I love Chris. He's intelligent. Excuse man, me, just not what the I clever said one. Just now stands clearly. Yeah, thanks, Mike's thanks in a right you. sassy attitude. <laughs> I'm channeling no, my no. Kenobi. No, but Mike, the thing is, I like to think that I just go through life blagging it. And I'm right on the coattails of Dave's genius. So that's the main thing. So, <laughs> And we're speaking about him like he's not there. But we did hear his voice a moment okay, ago. So the, the true podfather, regardless of how jealous Chris gets, we are here also with Dave Horrocks. How are you doing, sir? I'm very good. I'm wondering what Chris is after calling me genius. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's think... lovely to be here and speaking to you all tonight. Mm, yeah, it's it's going to be absolutely delightful. Uh, always fun to chat with all of you, both in this podcast and different ones. We've got a lot to talk about uh, with this episode. And so when we start with, obviously, myself and Megan spoke for a while about our opinions on the first two episodes. Um, so let's go around again in the same order I did of just your opinions on the first two episodes, just for ease. So Ria, what did you think of the first two episodes in brief? I liked them. That was very brief. Cool. Chris, what did you, <laughs> what did you think? A lot. Mm. Is this one of those games where we finish each other's sentences? Everyone says one or two words and we make a story. Is that where this is going to go? I think Reed <laughs> has done me there because I had it all ready to be smart. I can't know. Um, no, I thoroughly enjoyed the first two episodes. I have got a problem with the... Um, granddad running that obi-wan seems to do after the kid who <laughs> seems to run it I'm, I'm slow as fuck and she seems to be running a yard in front but he can't catch her and this happens all the way through the episodes but we'll talk about that but other than that fully enjoyed it wonderful what about you dave what do you think of the first two episodes absolutely love it there's nothing that gives me more joy than like being in this you know in and around star wars and new hope you know that original star wars movie and uh, having these characters I, i've just been i, I love the first two episodes and then this one just takes it to 11. there's oh, yeah. nothing all of the all of the marvel stuff all of the dc stuff you know great movies and everything but there's nothing that gives me just pure joy like being here in this universe Mm -hmm. yeah completely obviously as people are aware of my huge star wars love so it's uh completely on, on board with those things and i will also say i know that everyone in the comics and motion family i imagine most of our listeners as well and definitely everyone in the zoom call um don't normally drop the c-bomb on this podcast yeah, I mean, we already did it but i'm gonna say <laughs> any people are like any critiques of certain actors in this episode or in in the series and things if they're valid critiques about their acting ability okay people have opinions but anyone who is harassing people online, I thought we were fucking past this, and being horrible um, to, I think it was, um, I've immediately forgotten, I think it's Moses Ingram, I think, the, the yeah. woman who plays uh, Reva. Yeah. Anyone who's yeah. harassing them, you're a fucking cunt, and I hate you, and you are not yeah. a Star Wars fan. Ewan McGregor came out and said a thing, but it just, it sickens me, and seeing some of the messages yeah, yeah. that were sent to her is appalling i thought we'd be on this i'm just very happy that she got to experience star wars celebration and like people like kevin scott and a few other star wars are people and people involved in star wars were saying oh we really need the star wars celebration the star wars convention and things which is happening in the uk next year and we're definitely going um and the they were saying like how nice it was a lot of the high republic authors to really interact with star wars fans who aren't keyboard warriors because you get so much negativity online and i'm so glad that moses ingram managed to see the positivity in the people cheering for her first before seeing all this horrible, horrendous 
shit that I just it, it makes me annoyed and I know it doesn't it's not the majority of Star Wars fans but it does in part make me ashamed to be a Star Wars fan because we have one of the most toxic fandoms on the planet yeah. and I don't understand why that it seems like every one of these people hate all of Star Wars apart from the original trilogy and they were like you know nearly 40 years ago so it's like <laughs> if that was all you like of Star Wars just fuck off simple I, I um, think it's more of a societal problem to be yeah. honest oh yeah, um, yeah. it's not uh, just Star Wars I think, has it yeah I, I just think Star Wars has such a wide reach it's got its statistically you're going to have a fair share of douchebags in there and yeah. so I, I think it's just unfortunate really yeah it is a shame but we try and stay positive both on styles comics and canon and also on the comics emotion network and things so i just want to say that out there just because it really pisses me off seeing about it and it really got me in a bad mood the other day when i read some of the comments but we are here to talk about the third episode of the obi-wan kenobi show um which i think we can probably all agree is what we've been saying is that this episode really smashed it it was very unexpected there were so many cool moments that happened in it that were just yeah amazing so we'll start with you megan i know that you can't remember half of this episode apparently um but from this episode of what you do remember did you enjoy it? are there any things you can remember that you enjoyed about it yeah it was all right yeah i liked it <laughs> <laughs> you try to beat ria in the, bl- in the briefest possible response i don't know why you came to me first you know that i don't really remember that much Be- um, because i thought you wouldn't say a huge amount and i thought i'd let you say the little drips and drabs of stuff before anyone talks about anything no more. i i liked it from what i can remember there are bits that are like coming back to me now that i'm properly thinking about it hmm. it was cool to see the the vader stuff oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the suit up at the start was... it was yeah because obviously at the end of the second episode is when you see that obi-wan has realized that anakin's not dead yeah so because we because there's that one moment where he sees like anakin in the distance like and and mike was like i think that was anakin and i was like well yeah but because Obi-Wan wouldn't have known that Anakin's Vader. Yeah, in the suit and stuff. Like, he would still remember him as just being Anakin. Yeah, but just a bit more crispy. Just a bit more crispy. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, no, that, all of that stuff was really cool. Mm. I, I liked seeing all of that stuff. I wanted to see them interact, and it it satisfied my needs. Yeah, and I think with this episode as well, what I really like about the series is that uh, Deborah Chow, she directed all of them. And although I really enjoyed The Mandalorian, I thought Book of Welfare is pretty good, although glaring issues with, you know, two of the episodes, but we won't get into that. We already had a whole uh, discussion uh, batch of shows on that. But these are all directed by Deborah Chow, and so it's, they're all one vision, they're all one kind of feel, which I'm really excited for. And it just seems to be ramping up and up, and it's very unexpected. And that was the main thing I was I was sort of worried about. So we start off with, you've got Vader suiting up, and you've got Obi-Wan and Leia stowing away, and they go to the planet Mapuzo, and um, then Obi-Wan sees Anakin in that sort of mirage, and obviously he's not in the suit, as Megan pointed out, because she he hadn't seen him in the Vader suit, so he had no idea. So for that sort of first part of the uh, show, if we start with uh, Chris, what were your sort of thoughts with Obi-Wan and Leia, like in general, how you kind of took them? Because I know online fans are uh, kind of uh, disjointed. Some people think one thing, others. What do you think about young Leia and Obi-Wan sort of connection and the first part of this episode? I think he's, I think Hugh McGregor's carrying it. She's a good little actress who plays Leia. Um... Like I say, I've just got the daft, stupid running thing. She's literally there, and he's like, come back. Like, you're trying to protect this princess from the all, you know, the fucking empire. And he's just there, like, putting his hand out. And when they, when they pan out, it looks even fucking worse. I'm just like, oh, it's supposed to believe that this kid is like fucking Seb Co and can just fucking run. She can't run. He can't run. But he, he's like, he's defending her honour until she does a run. And then he just, and it, honestly, I know it sounds really silly, this might like I'm proper picking, but it just pissed me off. Every time I saw it, I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake, let her do a runner so you've not seen her leg it. And then go, where's she gone? Oh, no, let's go and find her. Not, oh, no. You know, if you were protecting her honour with your life and you've come out of retirement and all this stuff that he's done, put a bit more of an effort in. Come on, Ben. You know what I mean? But I do think. There, I think she plays the part well of like the young feisty Leia, mm. and there's a bit of spirit to her. Obviously, um, Carrie Fisher's character is an extension. It explains how she knows Ben Kenobi. Obviously, she called her son Ben as well, so um, I presume it's something to do with this. So, yeah, I just think it's really strong, and I think what Dave said, this is made me want to go back and watch all the films again. I know we mm. covered them about 18 months ago, and I've not watched them properly since. I've watched them... Um, the Rise of Skywalker recently again, but I do want to go back and watch him. I think the world is just so immersive 
and they've done it right. Whereas like Booker Boba Fett was absolute wank other than the middle <laughs> episode. It was fucking shit. So, uh, <laughs> but, but this, this is a return to form Mandalorian mm. levels. I think, and I think it's up there with Mandalorian definitely mm. at the moment. So what yeah. About- what about you, Ria? What do you think of the dynamic with Obi-Wan and Leia and the first sort of part of this episode? Yeah, I, I don't disagree with Chris, but I can't tell where that decision's coming from. So I, I'm i thoroughly enjoying this series. I, can, I completely agree with you, Chris, as well. Like It's Mando for me, as in up there, how much I'm enjoying it. Unexpectedly enjoying it as well. I went in quite cautiously. My other half example, who's a huge Star Wars fan, huge Star Wars nerd, is not watching it because he's like, I'm just a bit done with the whole thing at the moment. Um He's like, there's just too much content. So it's just me watching it by myself. It's been like, oh, when am I going to find the time to do it? I watched it and then I've absolutely loved it. But I can't, so I agree with you about the uh, the Ben Kenobi and, and Leia. I really like her as an actress. I think she's great. I think she's doing great work. I did not like her when we were first introduced to her. I thought she was, I agree with Megan, an absolute brat. Um, yeah, she was and very I, bright. Yeah, and I didn't like the dynamic with her parents either. I didn't think that worked very well. I didn't like how, like, the queen had to be sort of like, oh, I'm I'm the classic cold queen who doesn't let you have any fun. Oh, but I'm the fun dad, blah, blah, blah. It felt a bit tropey, but it's all warmed on me. But there is something that, and I don't know if it's in the writing or the acting, where it's quite, it feels like Obi-Wan, it's like he he doesn't want to try He's because he's trying to separate himself from it so much. Mm. I don't know if this is me projecting or if people agree that he's just sort of like when she's running off, it's a bit like, Oh, it's a bit of an effort to go and get her, isn't it? Um, and not only do we all feel like that about our own children, <laughs> love my child, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, it's a bit like, Oh, if I go there, I actually have to deal with her and look after her. And I don't know how much I want to do that. And, and I feel like there's some sort of an internal struggle. I'm just not sure the execution is perfect. But I, I'm sort of willing to overlook that because I think Hugh McGregor's performance is absolutely stellar, um, way better than prequels. It's like he's just so good in this that, you know, I think they're trying to reach for something, but it's not quite getting there. Mm. And what about you, Dave? Yeah, I mean, I think this is all first act stuff, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Still, you know, the, the last time we'd seen Obi-Wan at the end of the prequels, he was still on top of his training. You know, he defeated Anakin and then he, he sort of took took the twins and, and sort of split them up and everything. Now he's kind of this broken man, isn't he? He's living off a little bit of space whale meat every day. And, you know, he's not been practicing with the force or anything. He's a bit shit. Chris, you're clearly yeah. not a horror fan, and which I know, but, you know, if you watch Michael Myers try and chase after someone, he sort of plugs <laughs> along. Yeah, he catches you know, them. While yeah. people are legging it and then he's round the corner, you know, it's just... I, that bit didn't uh, bug me at all. And and I thoroughly believe this little actress, Vivian Blair, I believe that she is Leia. Yeah. She's a sassy little pain in the arse, but you can see that that's where she's going to go to. And uh, I, I think it's really, really good. And and the fact that, you know, she, she wasn't uh, trusting of Obi-Wan. Well, you know, she's in a strange place and kids are dumb. They, they just are, <laughs> you know, and they're a pain in the ass, which I mentioned before. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I really liked it, the way this all came together. And you get some moments. I'm not sure I'm madly in love with how uh, Obi-Wan speaks about Padme regularly. Like, mm. it implies there's more there. You know, the way he looks at her, oh, it reminds me of your mum. Bit creepy, Obi-Wan. Uh, rain it in a bit. But, yeah, I, I just love the, the dynamic and, and those two together. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I I love the Leia. I, I when Megan said that she felt like she was a spoiled brat, I didn't actually necessarily get that vibe. But I have, I'm a sucker for a smart ass, mainly because I am one. And me as a child, I was the, the worst. Um, so when I see a smart ass kid, I'm just like, no, you're just a kid who's more intelligent than you are for your age. And the problem is when you have a kid who's quite young, who's more intelligent than their peers, they think they're more intelligent than the adults. And that's when they seem like kind of a dick. And that's what I was like and probably am still like now. But it's it's one of those things where the dynamic between Obi-Wan and Leia, I think the way I kind of perceive it is just obviously Obi-Wan is a broken man. And the last time he was kind of happy was when he was him and Anakin were friends. And obviously Padme was quite important to him as a friend and things like that. And I think it's just kind of like it's this light like Leia is this light. She's this potential. She's she's something there that he he's just been by himself in a cave like he's done for the last decade, probably nothing of any enjoyment at all. And seeing this 
girl who's so full of life who reminds him of Padme. I wonder if that's kind of where it is. But he does he does talk about her quite a lot. For something that's meant to be a secret, you're like, how close are you <laughs> pushing this? Like, we know she didn't know about her Padme and stuff that much until the sort of original trilogy well, era. It's, it's no real surprise that she was like, are you my real dad? Yeah. Because obviously he keeps talking yeah. about it. Like, I didn't yeah. really think of that until you said it, but... Like, there's no real surprise that this, like, inquisitive girl is like, well, are you my real dad? Because clearly you you keep banging on about my mum. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you must have known her. <laughs> is it you? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I think, I, oh, go ahead, if, if I could just say as well, I think it's becoming clear why Obi-Wan has to go back to Tatooine. Because mm. Luke is a bit shit, isn't he? And she, uh, Leia has got more sass and more wit about her at 10 years old that Luke had when when we met him in A New Hope. So Obi-Wan's probably like, look, you'll be fine. I, I need to go and uh, look after your brother because he's going to like shoot himself in the face with a lightsaber or something <laughs> if I don't look after him. <laughs> there is one thing, like, I know there's been... Um... There were some comics that I haven't read, which were Star Wars What If comics. I think they came out around the time or just before the prequels. But I, I'm very sure that Star Wars, Disney, are going to make some What Ifs of Star Wars. They've been around buzzing for a while, and I suspect because they keep doing animated things. I would love to see what if Leia went to... like What if Bale and Breha Organa wanted a boy instead of a girl? What if Luke went mm. there... And maybe Luke became a sniveling little twat and then like the cousin that we get introduced to and then maybe Leia becomes like this absolute unfathomable badass. And I would love to see that because in Legends you do get points where Leia becomes a Jedi and in the Force Unleashed games, which are my favourite, that's what one of my tattoos is of, there's the um, some downloadable content where you become a uh, star ki- well, you're star killer. He goes, there's a good ending and a bad ending. If you choose the bad ending, you become like the new Darth Vader. And in that, you hunt down Luke, Leia, Chewie, and Leia. Uh, sorry, yeah, Luke, Han, Chewie, and Leia. And you fight Leia as a Jedi on Hoth instead of Luke being there because you've already killed him. And it's so incredible. And it's like Leia as a Jedi. You even, like, one of the few parts of the Rise of Skywalker that I loved was seeing the Leia stuff with her Jedi training. And it's pretty obvious, I think, from the original trilogy and everything else we've got, canon or legends, that Leia is so much better at everything than Luke is. Yeah. Luke is just this fumbling, useless child so who happens to have so force powers. Bitch. He does suck quite hard. <laughs> He's only cool in the sixth one. He's just like Anakin. He's a whiny little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, completely agree. Um, that, that's what I like about this show, though, because it's so easy. And this is one of my biggest complaints about the newest films, specifically The Rise of Skywalker. It's so easy to focus on Luke and the men of the Star Wars universe because that's where most of the focus has been. And for this to switch it up, to both having Leia and Reva is absolutely amazing, but they don't rewrite anything. I could watch this without having seen the original trilogy, and I think it works. So you understand immediately that that, you know, I think Carrie Fisher would come on screen and you would immediately know that she is the older version of this little Leia. If you didn't know that, like, little Leia, little Leia. Oh, that's so cute. Why didn't I call my child Leia? Um, uh, <laughs> my niece is called Leia, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my, uh, my, my child is named after a different Star Wars character. Anyway, um, uh, you know, I think you can see that, and I think that's really good writing. I think they've gone, we're not retconning anything. We're just going to make her competent and interesting. Sure, a little bit annoying, I'm not going to lie. Because we know that older layer is competent, interesting, a little bit annoying. You know, it, they've not really had to think too hard about it. They've just gone, we've got Carrie Fisher, who's awesome. Let's just take that as the template and just make it into a little kid. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree completely. It's, and it's one thing as well, like I've always been a defender of the prequels. I, I do think the original trilogy is pretty much objectively better than the prequels in almost every way. But I personally love the prequels and I think there's moments in Revenge of the Sith for me that eclipse almost anything in Star Wars. Mainly Order 66 and the Mr. Fast stuff. But what I like about Kenobi is what it's doing, especially in the part later on in this episode that we'll get on to shortly, is that the prequels are very cheesy, that's the problem. You know, the original trilogy had a layer of cheesy campiness to it, but it didn't lean too much into it. And George Lucas, I think, in a misguided way, the prequels got a lot of hate because he just needed someone to wind him back a bit like they did in episodes five and six. And I think the prequels, there's a lot of goofy moments. There's parts that really take you out of the universe. And you're like, what? What is this dialogue? What is this? This acting moment isn't very good. And I think what Kenobi is doing, it's like, right, 
we're late we're connecting all of the brilliance and the cleverness and the cinematography of the original trilogy and the original storytelling mixing with the best elements of the prequels, which is mainly the lore and the darkness of it and the intrigue of sort of how the Jedi got to where they were in the original trilogy. So I'm, I'm hoping it's kind of being the culmination of the best of both parts. That's my hope for it. And if it continues on this trajectory, I would uh, think it is. Um, so you move on to sort of Kind of the middle part. And you've got um, Obi-Wan and Leia. They are they hitchhike with a guy who's played by Zach Braff from Scrubs, which I had to look it up. I was like, I recognize that guy's voice. And I couldn't find the species of this guy called Freck, but he looks like a star-nosed mole. And if no one's ever heard or seen a star-nosed mole, look it up. It's freaky. It looks yeah, the, the nose of it is, because I showed you the picture, didn't I? It was, it's very weird looking things. But you get that. You get Reva, uh, Reva talking to Darth Vader as well, which I quite like. She's, you know, all the Inquisitors trying to one-up each other. I really like that element. Mm. And you've got Obi-Wan uh, sort of hitchhiking with the guy and they get the Stormtrooper interaction. So, so, if we, so I'm yeah, assuming, because in the last episode, Reva jabs him with a lightsaber, doesn't the, she? A Grand Inquisitor, yeah. yeah. So I'm assuming he's actually mm. dead. Well, the thing is... Because they were talking about who's going to be the next Grand Inquisitor and Vader's like, whoa, if you do what I ask, blah, 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 you'll become the next one. But... We haven't seen him again. So He's in Rebels. That's the thing. Well, that's the mm. thing. So I, I wonder if they're either going to clone him or they're just keeping him quiet and he's just going in the back to tank. Because they, the guy who plays him, um, Rupert something, he specific- Friend. There you go, Rupert Friend. He specifically mentioned the fact that about Granny Krista being in Rebels. And everyone knows that. It's not like this little mm. weird thing that's only in a comic that only I've read. It's a major, major part of season one of Rebels. Because I was even looking it up. I was like looking at them side by side and I was like, they have the exact same markings. So it must mm. be the same person. Either that was cloning. I, I, I hope it's not cloning because that's a bit of a cop out, <laughs> but it, it could be, but he was stabbed in the gut. So what, what is the, the character, um, in Mandalorian, uh, played by, is it Ming-Na Wen? Uh, Fennec Shand. Fennec Shand, that's it. I mean, she got shot in the stomach, didn't she? And she had all her, Sort of insides. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think he could. He's not dead, let's no. face it. He's it, it definitely in Rebels. That is the same Grand Inquisitor. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm positive. I'm fairly sure of that as well. But so if, if we talk about basically up to the point almost where um, Obi Wan comes into contact with uh, Vader, because that's going to be sort of the main part of this conversation. Um, so if we start with, I mean, uh, Dave, why don't you tell us what are your sort of opinions and thoughts on all the moments of the hitchhiking, the interaction with the stormtrooper, the laser gate, any of those sort of elements or anything else you want to bring up, we'll go from there. Well, I think the first thing is the um, the guy out of Scrubs, Zach, mm. playing that that mole. What was it? Star-faced mole or something. Um, I thought it was Seth Rogen. When really? I heard it, I thought straight away, I thought, oh, that's Seth Rogen. Uh, but yeah, he... Seem to be there because Leia, she's she's this she's smart, but she's like optimistic as well. Whereas Obi Wan is jaded, you know, and he just doesn't trust anyone. And you're sort of thinking, oh, this is like her lesson for him. You know, you can trust people. And then he turns out to be a massive bloody douchebag in the turncoat. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I can't believe they did that. Um, so I. I Although it's it's consistent, you know, he's a troop carrier, isn't he, for the Empire and loves the Empire. So, you know, I thought they were going to give us a little bit of greyness. You know, some people who are just doing low level jobs, they're, they're not necessarily bad people. They're just trying to get on in the, the galaxy. Um, but I, I think when what's troubling me and I'm sure they I'm sure they'll handle it OK. But what is troubling me a little bit is I need it to make sense for when we get to a new hope mm -hmm. yeah. and the fact that it, obi-wan's caught on camera and it's like broadcast over the star wars internet or, or whatever you know at least the imperial version of it it's like right so vader definitely knows he's alive and i thought he was still going to be throughout this series all in the shadows and everything and and like almost like a rumor almost like daredevil kind of thing you know no you know you hear rumors could it be obi-wan could it not but no he is there he's on camera it's definitely him and then you know you get this coming together between obi-wan and darth vader which was just amazing you know again i i just think was fantastic but again i'm trying to think like to a new hope dialogue where he says you know i felt feel this presence that i haven't fe felt since you know and i'm thinking well to be fair he's a bit vague so it could be this moment but 
that dialogue implies it was like a long, long time ago. But it's 20 years, isn't it? It's like 20 years from, or roughish, from now to A New Hope, I think. Revenge of the Sith to uh, A New Hope is 19 years, because Luke's 19 years old. Okay, so, this, so it's even, so it's like right, nine, so it's even worse. nine to 10 years. It's nine that. years then to that. Come on. We all remember nine years ago, like it was yesterday, or at least I do. I was thinking <laughs> 20 years is like 2002, and it's like, yeah, I remember that pretty well. So, yeah, it's not, I, I'm just worried that it's not going to make complete sense. But parking that to the side, I thought the uh, interaction was brilliant. I, I just didn't think we'd see Vader as much as you know we have done. I thought he'd be a little cameo in the series, but to have him there front and center and absolutely kicking the arse of Obi-Wan. I, I mentioned this is like the first act, right? They, this is when Obi-Wan is down on his knees. This is Rocky III. He's had his confidence shattered. And basically, he's, he's having his ass whipped by Darth Vader. At some point, I'm expecting a, a rocky montage. I'm expecting Obi-Wan on Hoth, running through the snow to hearts on fire, <laughs> practicing, training with, the, uh, training with the Force. And then at some point, he's going to destroy Vader. He's going to have him looking like Monty Python's Black Knight. Uh, you know, from <laughs> Monty Python's Holy that's Grail. That's one of my favorite Monty and Python moments. That's how he figures out that he's more machine than man. You know, this is my own little head cannon that I'm, I'm just making up here. But but he has to get his mojo back, doesn't he? Mm. So just I got so excited watching this, and like I say, because we know where it kind of ends up. We know he's not going to kill Obi Wan or anything. I thought I, I, dragging him through the fire is like a retribution for what happened to him. Just thought it was brilliant. The only little nitpick I'll have is that when they're on the on the other side of the fire and he literally sees the robot you know the carrier robot or whatever they call him picking up obi-wan and wandering off and he just stands there and does nothing i'm like you can you've got you could just like force choke him or something you you could do anything he just seemed to give up the chase a little bit easy but that was a tiny little nitpick i just thought this whole interaction was brilliant mm, nice so chris with, with your opinions on just sort of with the there's the Obi Wan moments with stormtroopers and hitchhiking and that guy and laser stuff, all those sort of elements. What were your opinions and thoughts of, of that kind of uh, with Obi Wan and Leia interacting with some of the stormtroopers and that guy, and then obviously up to the the Vader interaction? What, what do you kind of think of that stuff? You know what? I've got questions, Mike. Go, I've go ahead. Questions. I've got answers. Don't you worry. <laughs> You're pretty little head. I'm sure there's a comic run, Mike. I'm waiting for it to explain <laughs> I don't it. Think Some of there's the holes. very, very few comics at this era. There's only one, which is the journals of old Ben Kenobi, where he fights Chris Antin, who pops up in uh, oh, yeah. Boba yeah. Fett. So there's yeah. a fun little thing. But I've already tackled that on Star Wars Comics and Canon. So if you listen to that, Chris, you'd know. Sorry, well, I've, I've heard you say Chris doesn't listen to some of these podcasts, but I do, Mike. Not, not straight away, because Dave and you giving me aggro. But anyway, um, I haven't got you back for that, actually, both of you. But anyway, so no, what I would say, so obviously, like Dave said, it's a rocky free redemption thing at the moment. He's down on his luck. He doesn't believe in being a Jedi. Couple of questions before I talk about that, that bit with the hitchhiking. If he's not using the Force, how's he protecting Leia and Luke from Darth Vader finding them? Because he's more powerful if he's not using it. His daughter's right next to him. Does when, when he stop? Is he looking at his daughter or is it Obi Wan? Because in the, the day she's doing a runner. Um, still doesn't work out that his daughter's within 20 yards of him. It's he's, he's Obi-Wan. Um, don't believe any of that for, for a minute. I think that's nonsense. If he's if he's not practicing the art of the Jedi and he's he's lost his bottle and everything, and he's not been doing any of his, you know, saying his prayers and taking his vitamins as the uh, great Hulk Hogan used to do, then how the fuck's he protected him? Don't believe any of that. But that's something you can explain in a minute. For the um hitchhiking bit. Did like it. I liked the bit of tension when he called a layer and the guard yeah. went, he just said layer, you know, and he, and he's like, uh, uh, oh, it's, it's a mother. So I get that. What was weird was he fucking takes everybody out and it's brilliant when he puts his, his hat up, you know, his um, hood up because he knows the face recognition is going to realise it's him. Takes them out, kills everyone like he's fucking Liam Neeson. But then <laughs> four or five more come at him and he goes, I'll tell you what, sorry. I'm getting on my knees. Don't worry I about think it. That. I what did think that. What the fuck's going on there? He's just gone full on badass. And then he's just gone, 
Um, okay, sorry about that, guys. I know it sets up the double cross from the guard and everything, but I was sort of like, this is so bipolar. How the fuck can you just take all these guys out who are probably harder to kill and they're all in front of you in a straight line? And we all know stormtroopers can't fucking shoot for shit. It have took them out straight away. So that bit was nonsense. And I loved the bit with Darth Vader and the tension and everything because I didn't think he was going to be in it. I thought he was going to be one scene at the end of the whole show and it was going to be a massive build-up for not much of a payoff and it'll lead into a potential sequel. Obviously, this is going to be probably just a one one and you're done type thing. Um, it might not be, but um, the way they've set it up, I really enjoyed it. Only nitpick as a massive Star Wars fan, which have had me blubbing big time, why didn't we have a suspenseful horror version of the Imperial March as he was walking down the street dragging everyone and choking him and everything. Or when he got Obi-Wan in the fire, I loved every bit of that. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was amazing, but that was just the one thing if I was going to criticise it. And it's very difficult to criticise it because I thought it was brilliant, but that that would have made so much sense. And I will say, Mike, because you'll get this reference, the music, I think it sounds like Spider-Man off the PS4, PS5. <laughs> you, think, you just want to connect any any podcast you do. You just want to talk about the Spider-Man game. I've just completed it again. <laughs> I've just completed it again. I'm, I'm on Miles again. But no, it does. The the music sounds like the Spider-Man music off the, the PlayStation. But but anyway, I loved it. I did love it, even though there's a couple of nitpicks. And it wouldn't be me if I didn't be a bit of a shit house. But Mike, <laughs> explain the force because it, it's very bipolar the way it's used in this at the moment. I'm not happy. I'll get on that in one second, but I realised that um, in the first episode that me and Megan did, I couldn't remember who the person who sorted out the music was. And it's someone called Natalie Holt. And she also did the music for Loki, which Loki is my favourite of all the Marvel series thus far, probably that and Moon Knight. But the music of Loki just top tier. And the music in all of these episodes so far has been absolutely incredible. John Williams uh, composed the score for the main Obi-Wan score. And obviously, like, variations of Jewel of Fates and things have come up. But uh, Natalie Holt, shout out to her, because she's done an absolutely incredible job, especially at the end of um, episode two, when you see Vader for the first time, that build-up, oh, incredible. Um, regarding the Force thing, the, I mean, the answer is just hand wavy. They didn't really think yeah. about it enough. But I would say, in universe, the problem is Vader thought his kids died. If you think your kids are dead, it doesn't matter what you sense. You would just think, or, you know, when Padme dies and her funeral is in episode three, she's died with, with the pregnant bump. So they are, the story is the kids and her died. So the idea is, Everyone thinks that Padme and the kids died and Vader was told that by Palpatine, basically. So even if you sense someone is force sensitive, you can't necessarily sense family bond. You can't sense DNA through the force necessarily. You can sense someone's force sensitive. So he might have been like, oh, this kid might be somewhat force sensitive to a degree. But aside from that, there's not really that element of things. I don't know about Obi-Wan sort of protecting them necessarily it's it's one of those things where yeah, i think he's gonna have a moment he keeps talking to qui-gon so i think in the next episode the one after he's gonna talk to qui-gon qui-gon's gonna give him a motivational speech and then suddenly he's gonna bulk out and you know <laughs> beat, beat vader yeah he's gonna go or he's gonna do like a gundam wing thing where he's gonna go engage and then loads of like parts of jedi stuff's gonna click on him and he's gonna become giant i don't really think that um but ria what do you think of all the stuff that we uh have discussed so far so a couple of things first of all i like talking about the force a lot but I, my interpretation of the Force, and not as well versed as you, Mike, but I have read quite a lot of books outside of You've the read a lot of legends. Films, You've read a lot right? more legends. You know a lot Played more about Mara Jane than I do. Um, <laughs> um, I, I do kind of, I do find the use of the Force in this particular episode a bit shaky, but that is because I could talk about the Force forever, which I won't do. Um, so first things first, you just talked about how Padme is buried with the big bump as if there are the twins still in there. Just, you know, when you have a baby, you keep the pregnant belly afterwards. That's so what calling I bullshit said. on that. Thank you very we, much. We watched, we watched episode yeah. three recently and I was like, well, she, she would have that regardless. <laughs> yes, thank you. It doesn't just go down. All your organs have to get back in place. I know. That's fun. I know, but the story <laughs> is still that her and her kids die. That is still the story in Star Wars. That's what I'm saying. Well, I think we should all look up and let's not do this. If a lady has a baby in her and dies, absolutely tragic. Whether the baby would stay in there and be buried or not, probably not. But whatever, let's move on. Just just wanted to point that out. But uh, yeah, so I am getting a bit... So I, I did actually love this episode, so I hate that I'm being a bit mean about it. 
But it sort of annoys me, again, the timeline that Dave was talking about. So I was reading this like eight, nine years between the end of Kenobi and A New Hope. So you're telling me he then goes to be a hermit. And then while he's hermiting for nine years, he suddenly starts going, do you know what I can do? I can use the force to make stormtroopers and people do what I want. Why is he not doing that in this episode when they're in the back of the truck? Why is he not hand wave? We we are not the Jedi you are looking for. Why is he not doing that? You know, I'm all for. I've had some wine. <laughs> uh, blasters, great, cool. Like it. But um, but I'm sort of like it. It, it's making that stretch of when he becomes the Obi-Wan that we see in A New Hope quite difficult for me. It doesn't mean that I'm not enjoying it in its own thing, but I just sort of, I already think the writing's really good. So let's just try and connect it up a bit more. Why is he not using any Jedi stuff? Oh, he doesn't want to be discovered. But also, you would be a bit sneaky Jedi, wouldn't you? Come on, you would. Um, and so it, that's just not working for me fully, but I'm willing to forgive it. I'm just nitpicking. Um I loved all the stuff with them being betrayed. I was like, they're totally going to get betrayed. This is going to be amazing. He's going to have to kick some ass, um, which was very exciting for me. Um, again, the sort of, you know, I don't think it fully fits with him using the blasters and stuff like that. But I thought what worked really well was when he was talking to Leia about, I, I agree, it's slightly creepy when he keeps on talking about Padme, but talking to her about her mum and about the force, I felt that fits really well into my and this is, you know, it's not canonical view. It's my view of his character and who he becomes and who we've seen before. So I really enjoyed that. I found it really touching and really affecting. Same. That all worked really well for me. And I feel like that's going to have a huge payoff later on when we see why in nine years time, he is sort of like helping out Leia, helping out Luke, getting back into the force, sensing Vader, sensing Anakin, all of that sort of stuff. It just, I don't know, it made me feel quite happy. Brilliant. And one thing I was thinking about this during the episode, but then I realized in myself, just because there might be some people who go, no, but wouldn't Leia recognize Ben when she sees him again? In A New Hope, they never meet. No, and I, I had to think about that. I was thinking about it, I was watching the episode and I was like, wait a minute. Because they go on the Death Star, obviously, to save her. Han and Luke... She um, sends the hologram and that's Han, it. Yeah, Han, they said, she sends the hologram saying you're my father and you work together in the Clone Wars, blah. Then Han and Luke go off to save Leia... Obi-Wan stays behind to sort out of the tractor beam and then they see him very briefly fight Vader and then he sees, you know, he turns and sees them getting on the Millennium Falcon, holds his saber up and becomes one with the Force. So he and Leia never meet in A New Hope and it, I realise that it feels like they did because your first question would be, I remember you, you look a bit older, but you're the bloke who literally went this massive adventure with and I've heard some people criticise that in the in some groups I'm in, but I'm like, they don't, they never meet. They never do, and it feels like they do. I can see Dave getting looking at it, thinking. See, mm-hmm. see I, I guess I'd I just thought about the dialogue, which was "Help me, Obi Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope." Yeah. So, so that totally fits this series that she'd have a relationship with him, you know, and she knows he is the best ninja that, <laughs> that she can call upon. But, but then you're right. I forgot about the bit where she talks about, you know, you helped my father in the Clone Wars and blah blah blah, and it's like. Oh uh, yeah, that that doesn't really fit that well. Um, I think she. That it's probably that thing of no one wants because Bale and Bray has say we don't want anyone to know Leia was captured because if they mm. find out, people are going to look more into her and work out where she's from. So yeah. I imagine from public record, her kidnapping's gone, or, or we'll probably see that sort of degree of. Well, they just, say it in the beginning, don't they, that they want it to be secret. Yeah, exactly. So they want it to be a secret. So I think that even her sending a message that could get intercepted, saying Obi Wan, you helped my father in the Clone Wars. She doesn't say her dad's name. She just says, you helped my father in the Clone Wars. So he helped both their uh, dads, biological and adoptive. And knowing obi ones in the Clone Wars, well, everyone knew that. So I, th- I would, once again, I'm a Star Wars apologist, so I can almost fit almost any plot hole or any dialogue thing into the universe because you could go, well, if sh- she is a rebel, she needs to make cryptic messages. She can't say, oh, hey, Obi-Wan, do you remember the time 10 years ago where you saved my life and we went on this massive adventure and you like fought Vader again? It was so crazy. Do you remember that? Well... I want you to help me again. You, know, you wouldn't necessarily. Like you've never heard my voicemails clearly. Yeah, but you are not a <laughs> princess of 
a massively amazing planet that Rude. also yeah i mean you're not you're Rhea's, not a princess Rhea is the the queen of my world oh that's very sweet <laughs> but you're not a planet still that's <laughs> leggings <getting some> presents. <laughs> <laughs> it's the gym yeah. i will say as well one thing i i note with um with like with with chris said you know when obi-wan kills what like six seven eight stormtroopers in a really cool way i like how he's like, evading and yeah. stuff and there's a lot of stuff in um star wars that says Jedi don't want to use blasters, but if they did, they would be incredible. I was say. just thinking about this. Yeah, go ahead. I was saying Obi-Wan hates blasters. He literally says That's in episode three, three that they're so uncivilized. <laughs> I've literally been waiting for a moment to say this. And you've been <laughs> talking about... Yeah, he literally goes on about how he doesn't like blasters. Yeah, well, that's back in... You know, that's back before the Jedi will basically exterminate and a mass genocide happens. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. It's just surprising that he'd be willing to go pew, pew, pew so, yeah. so quickly. Obviously... <laughs> Obviously, he's protecting Leia. Like well, I get that, but I, why got, wouldn't he go? Well, this is the thing. I've got I've got two two critiques somewhat of this. Which the first one is when I saw exactly as Chris said. When you see the troops got off the transport and you, the the cover of the back of it is up, and you see three troop heads, I was like, oh, that's going to fall down, and there's going to be like twenty on there, and it falls down. You just see their legs, and you're like, why was that a reveal? And you go, the three of them. I, I, if me in that position with a gun, I could probably kill those stormtroopers. They're terrible shots. That's I'm, a I'm boozy not, statement. I'm not bad yeah, with an air. I'm not well. actually. I'm pretty damn good with an air rifle. So just saying, I could be a sharpshooter. Oh, Mike, you know, Mike, I'm the I'm next combat. I'm loving your confidence in yourself today. I'm <laughs> yeah, pretty good with an air rifle. I was a really intelligent kid who annoyed everybody. Yes, I was. I, I need. <laughs> Can I have some of that confidence? Mike could have beaten Palpatine. I could have done. I did, in fact. Um, I did. Um, the thing is, because I'm still riding on the high that Kevin Scott not only came on my podcast ages ago, but also listened to me and Tony talk about his comic and retweeted it, and loads of people have been retweeting it. So I'm just on a high from that. Um, and also, I've been drinking, so that helps. <laughs> I mean, but, I just basically was like, I'm a princess, Mike. Come on. Yeah, so, <laughs> but another part I did think was, I was like, oh, we're not going to see Kenobi use his lightsaber very much because, you know, he's trying to be incognito. But then they literally say, we're fight, we're trying to find the Jedi. And they see him, they go, there's the Jedi. And you go, okay, if someone knew I'm a Jedi, I'm just going to ignite the lightsaber and throw it at them. But he's like, oh, yes, I'm not going to use the lightsaber. It's like, but if they're shooting at you and a child, the best possible defense you have is your deflective laser sword. They already <laughs> know that you're a Jedi. They, you're already wanted. Why waste time? What if one stray bot got Leia? We all know it's not going to happen, you know, unless he gets her in the arm or something lame. But like, you know, that did bother well, me a bit. His face has literally been everywhere. Yeah, like he he's a, he's got a bounty on his head, hasn't he? Yeah, exactly. So I was a bit like, oh, why is that happening? Um, but before we're going to talk about the Vader stuff and things, but I, I do want to mention a couple of moments. There's something called the Path System, which is when um, the woman Tala. Um, who is played by, and I've got her name here, it is um, in Indira Varma. People may recognise her because she was one of the characters in Game of Thrones from Dorm. Hilaria um, Sand. Mm. Amazing actress. Yeah. yeah. She is absolutely stellar. I really enjoyed seeing her. I'm sad to think she may not be in it much more, but I really hope she is because she's an absolute talent. And with her interaction when they go in the path, I love that. And I was basically yelling at the screen when Quinlan Voss was mentioned because my number one thing is if Quinlan Voss, which Chris is like, who the fuck are you talking about? If Quinlan Voss shows up in the Kenobi series or if he's going to get his own series or anything, I may cry. I love Quinlan Voss. He's a character who's quite big in Legends. Um, he's in the Clone Wars animated show. You actually can see him in The Phantom Menace. He was an extra in The Phantom Menace on Tatooine. And, and George Lucas liked the look of him so much, he created a character from that extra, which I think was quite cool. Um, I need the, to look him up. I can't remember. Quinn Levos, he's got dreadlocks and he's got a yellow stripe across the center oh, of his face. Oh, yeah. He has, Is like, he the one that's a bit of a dickhead? Yeah, him and Kenobi have like a <laughs> yeah. rivalry. They, they have yeah, a rivalry. yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone doesn't like him. No. Yeah, no, I remember. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a book called... Kenobi Mike's going to cry over. Yeah, well, the there's one. a book called Dark Disciples. <laughs> Pool, um, which is all about Quinlan Voss and Asajj Ventress, and it follows on from the Clone Wars and things. And Quinlan Voss is such a deep, interesting character, and I really like him. He's super so cocky. He is very cocky, yeah. But I mean, Kenobi's quite cocky as well. He's very sassy. Not in this show. <laughs> in this show, he's definitely not. <laughs> in this show, he's like a di- like a dishevelled shell. He is. He's like a prune. <laughs> he is. He's like a little little raisin of <laughs> of a Kenobi. Um, but I really like that path system, and I like the idea. I'm sure there's. I'm sure many people have broken down the screenshots of some of those carvings on the wall because some of it was in Arabesh, and I can't read Arabesh. It's just the spoken Arabesh is Galactic Basic, which is whatever language you're watching Star Wars in. It's that language. Yeah, they don't have but Arabesh on Duolingo, do they? They don't. No. Um, but I I've tried looking it up and stuff. But I just I can't be asked. It trying to learn it is silly. Um, but we get onto sort of the main point is. 
when we get to the Vader confrontation, which is a big moment. And I want to say that my the part I took away from it was I love when Marvel or Star Wars gets dark. I like it when I don't need it to be an R rating or you know 15 or 18 or anything like that. But I like it when they push the boundary. I think Rogue One did that quite a lot. I think in Episode Three with Order 66 and Anakin, that bit where he ignites the lightsaber against the younglings and that kid takes a step back, that still gets me today. I'm like Jesus Master Christ, Master Skywalker, what, what are we going to do? do? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like that bit when he ignites the saber. You're like. You didn't need to include that, George, but I'm glad you did. Um, but when Star Wars gets dark, I think they really hit home. And when you've got Vader walking through that village, and he's he just, is he's just, just being, fucking everyone up. He's yeah. being an arsehole for the sake of being an arsehole. Yeah. He's like, all of these people have done me no wrong. I'm looking for one specific he's person. He's trying to draw out the I, Jedi. Yeah, no, I know. I know that. But I'm just going to kill this child. Snap. It was and a child. You don't see that the very network. often, do you? No. People killing children. You, you don't mm. see that often. And Luke's like, but there's still good in you. <laughs> and then he tries to kill Hitler. Kylo Ren in his sleep in episode eight. And you're like, um, well, yeah, anyway. Uh, but yeah, when he's walking through that village, and y- y- I love how in this, because obviously in, in the original trilogy, everyone's like, oh my God, Vader's a badass. He's really cool. And then the prequels happen, and everyone's like, oh, Vader's not as much of a badass as we thought. And you see him in Rogue One, you go, no, he is. In the canon, Vader's one of the most terrifying beings ever. Like, no one fights Palpatine, because Palpatine's so above it, no one even thinks of Palpatine like that. So Vader's the enforcer. Vader's the one with the power. And there's a game called Jedi Fallen Order, which is incredible. And very minor spoiler, but Vader shows up at some point in that. I wouldn't say anything else about it, but in that he's... I'm actually just playing it right at this point. I mean, it's been so, out for like three or so four years. So happy for so you. It, it's yeah, no, incredible. No, I'm joking. I, I know he's in it. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually playing it though. I haven't played it's it. So, it's played such it a good yet. game. But in, I know he's in it. There's so a moment good. in that, but you get the you get the feeling of how Vader is so much above any other yeah. Force user at that time. He is so... And when you get the moment in Rogue One, you feel that because you never see anything like that. In the prequels, it's, you know, red lightsaber against blue lightsaber for the most part. And, you know, CGI fighting. And then the original trilogy is just Luke against everyone else. But Vader is so imposing. And I thought when he walks through that village and you've got all the Inquisitors hanging back and you just watch Vader looking around thinking, I I care so little about human life. I'm just going to pick up this person and choke them, carrying them through the through the village. Oh, everyone's not paying attention. Dead, throw down. Here's another one. Screaming, choking, dying. Oh, I don't care. And just that moment where he's walking through, I was like, do you remember that bit where we were both audibly gasped when um, someone's like laying against the wall and he just looks at them and does that and the whole uh, neck that's goes... That's the kid. That's the like, kid. Yeah, yeah, that's the kid that's neck gets snatched. And yeah. you're like, Jesus Christ, this is Star Wars and I just watched someone's neck get yeah, snatched. Yeah, at, at that point I was like, Mike, what age rating is this? And he's like, a 12? And I was like, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so if we focus kind of on on Vader and the villagers and basically from here to the end of the episode really of I know Dave sort of touched upon it a bit but if we start with you Rhea like Vader in this like what did you think you've got the suiting up bit right at the start where all the bits what do you think of Vader in, in this episode in this series as a whole so far I think it really wipes out all of the bad feelings you have from the prequels I, I think... have no bad feelings of the prequels <laughs> thank you very much I love sad sorry <laughs> <laughs> But uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty average middle on the prequels. But um, oh, you this. two all right? But I'm not a huge fan of where they end up with Vader. The wobbly no, and I know Mike has an apology should go, but he's just been made into a machine. He won't be able to walk, and he misses Padme. No, it's no, not just poor that's directing. It's bits. poor acting. That, that no and, is one of the worst bits in all the prequels. I'd yeah, say even terrible. worse than Jar Jar. And the fact they edit it <laughs> in the special edition and they put it into Return of the Jedi. Megan's not seen a version without that oh, no. no. That part Megan. is the, one of the worst. That's my edits. favorite bit. It's one of the worst edits. I hate it. No one talks like that, and I despise. <laughs> Is it Saria? That's one part I will never defend. <laughs> Vader's no in Revenge of the Sith and the edit of Return of the Jedi is horrendous and terrible. But sorry, continue. <laughs> I just want to clarify that. I'm not defending that shit. <laughs> uh, but I think it's, again, a nice continuation from Revenge of the Sith, which I think, again, I just think the writing on this series is so strong from, from when he kills the younglings to when he's fighting Obi-Wan on Mustafar. You know, it is really dark. I remember watching that in cinema and being like, Jesus Christ. Like, the others have been all like, oh, I'm Jar Jar. I'm a racist interpretation. Great. And, like, Oof. and you know, or 
mm, trade, brilliant, how thrilling. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're like, what is going on? This is so really, really dark. And I think <sighs> this continues on with it. And I, I do think there's probably a, se- a section of fans who be like, yeah, Vader's so amazing, forgetting that Vader's supposed to be evil. Um, it's cool that he's killing everybody. I don't think it's cool that he's killing everybody, but I think the way it's done is amazing. We know how evil and how dark he is and how much he's fallen. And as Dave pointed out, is there good in him? Because it doesn't seem like there is. So, you know, you know, they say they're sens- sensing it. I would say the only time you probably think is there good in him is I think he hesitates in going after Obi-Wan. I don't think it's that because he can't that he he can't. I think it's because he doesn't want to, because there is still something in him. You know, we don't actually know what his fully what his journey is from when he's he's first first becomes Darth Vader to now in what he's been put through by by Palpatine. We don't know what's happened. And I just liked that pause that it's a sort of, you know, it's almost as if am I going to go down this road? Am I going to do this? Am I going to kill my old master? Is there something that's holding him back? But I just thought it was like, (laughs) it was like a horror film. It's great. I love horror films. My favourite genre, as you know. Um, And just so shocking, just so completely not what I expected. And, you know, what a moment. (laughs) Yeah, completely, completely agree. What about you, Chris? What do you think about Vader as a whole and the bit with the villagers and his interaction with Obi-Wan and just decimating Obi-Wan? I think it's if you look at Kylo Ren in the new ones, it's very similar, just wantonly taking people out, where obviously in the original, it's 40 years old. um, You know, he is Darth Vader. And once he sort of... um, meets Luke and everything and realises he's son and all that thing. That's when, for me, that's when you get that sort of face turn, you know, wrestling terminology uh, from being this badass. But then in this, I just think it's brilliant. I think the the way they, they've made him actually be bad is none of this fucking Disney bullshit where we see stuff off camera. I love the bit where he's dragging that person on the floor with a face down and he's just like, like he's carrying a, like a, a towel or something. Come on, come with me. <laughs> he's got a lead on someone. It's really bad and really haunting. And it's sort of like Obi-Wan's there going, shit, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And he doesn't know what, what he's going to do, does he? He's, he's thinking, I'm I'm basically fucked now. You know, I've got to face him. I don't want to face him. I don't think anybody want to face him. I just love the fact that the myth of Darth Vader when I was a kid was like, he was the worst person in the world you want to run into. There was him and Freddy Krueger, who I could quite happily like hide under the quilt all night and just be like, I don't want to fucking uh, even come under this, you know, come from under this quilt because I was just so scared of him. But when you actually watch him, he doesn't really do anything other than at the start of A New Hope where he obviously, you know, to get the plans and everything, you see a bit of off camera stuff and that, and he's taking all them guards out. But in this, this is what I want to see. This is what I want to see Darth Vader being an absolute, as Rhea would say, see you next Tuesday. So um, I <laughs> oh, genuinely... you're so polite. No, I'm not, but <laughs> I'm really bad for swearing. But, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, he's been a cunt, basically. I'll, I'll say <laughs> <laughs> I'm All on a T-shirt, Vader, Vader's, Vader's yeah, being a right cunt. <laughs> I'm, cunt. I'm the worst for swearing, Rhea, so don't worry. Vader, I'll, I'll... stop being a cunt. Have a Snickers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. And it just shows it was like Anna could have popped when you're hungry. Yeah, yeah, we know you get a bit now. But no, I think the way they set it, like I said, the only criticism was the music. That would have been for me as a fanboy in, on Star Wars, it would have absolutely been had me smiling, probably tearing up if he just had that some version of a maniacal imperial march, even if it's just mm. little touches of the of the thing, you know, of the I just I just think it worked. And then when I've got my props ready which I obviously always have this mic, it's the only prop I've got, but then he would have that, you see, and he'd be walking down there. <laughs> for, any listen, just, for any people only listening, he's holding up a Darth Vader mask. Look, and it even turns, Watch this on YouTube, go ahead. There you go, look, that way. Um, but, but no, I, I loved it, and I keep saying it, but I just thought it was brilliant. Really, really good end, and, and I cannot wait now for next week. As much mm. as I love this weekly segment, it was almost at the point where I was like, I wish this was Netflix and I could watch him in a go. But then I'm sort of like, no, because he, he might be an anti-climax. So he's given me so much hope for next Wednesday that this is going to be even better. And I do think, Dave, you were saying about Rocky Three. I almost think it's, we've got a Dark Knight type, um, Dark Knight Rises type um, 
version here, you know, where Batman comes out of retirement, but he's not the same guy. He's got a foot knee. He's not as tough as he thinks he is. Bane kicks his ass, breaks his back. He can leap 100 feet out of this prison and then he comes back. And it's the it's the return story that I love in these movies. So no, I think I Obi-Wan's going to do the business at the end. I really I like that. would be great if that was sort of like how this ended. And so then we know who he's going to be in New Hope. That would yeah. be pretty awesome. Yeah, definitely. And Dave, so what are your sort of thoughts? I know you touched on them earlier with uh, Vader and things, but like the village scene and every other element of Vader, like what are you thinking of this and what do you want from Vader going forward? So I think for me, it doesn't quite reach the heights of Rogue One. Mm. So when Rogue One just decimates all those rebels is still one of the most iconic moments in cinema. I, I don't think it quite reaches that. And I think also... What I would point out is that run of Darth Vader by Charles Saul, yeah. it, it does go straight from Revenge of the Sith, so when he becomes Darth Vader, and you do see his kind of evolution to become the Darth Vader that, that we know in the movies, and he does wrestle with it, you know, and he, he, he you do see there's a bit of a fake out where, you know, it looks like, oh, he's going to turn good. Oh, no, that was a, like a fever dream kind of thing. And, you know, it, it is just a really, really good run. So if you're going to read any Star Wars comics, I, I highly recommend that Darth Vader run. Mm -hmm. um, but even though it doesn't hit the, the heights of uh, Rogue One, I still think it was absolutely brilliant. And the only way I can describe it, if you've ever seen a, a movie, a kid's movie called Zootopia. Yeah. Oh, I love that there, movie. Right? Such a good film. And he gets Sloth. told a joke. When you hear that it's actually James Earl Jones with playing Darth Vader, my face just it lights up like a grinning idiot. I'm just so happy because I, I just never expected that, you know? So it was fantastic. And the fact that you see him being absolutely badass, something that Chris and I have discussed a, a number of times on VHS Strikes Back is that you don't often see kids killed in films. You know, so when it comes up, it's we're always quite shocked by it. To see it in a fucking Disney you know, Star Wars series, yeah. I was just really, really shocked by that. And I had to actually rewind it because I thought, because it was quite dark, wasn't it? And I thought, oh, was that the dad? Uh, no, no, I, it was definitely the kid. So uh, I, I thought it was fantastic. And it, it just the show, the demonstration of power, that he is just too much for Obi-Wan now. He's just, Obi-Wan's nothing on him. You know, the master has become, oh, the student has become the master. So, I, like I say, I, I've laid my cards on the table where I want it to leave. I want it to leave with Monty Python's Holy Grail, Black Knight, you know, <laughs> cut up, you know, and Obi-Wan's like, oh, you're more than machine than man. Oh, I beat you again kind of thing and, and then tail off. But yeah, I, you know what? I, I, I guess, but I'm not really going to think about it too deeply. I just, I'm just quite happy to go along for the journey here. We're we're kind of halfway through the series now, so this is Obi Wan's almost his low point. He's had his ass kicked. He needs to get his mojo back. He needs to go through a training montage and then face Vader down again. And I think we've got to see Hayden Christensen at some point, haven't we? Yeah, we got like a glimpse, but he is actually playing Vader in the suit, which is one thing mm. I was going to mention, which is something right. that I think I think is really interesting because obviously in the original trilogy, I think it was David Prowse. And he he got a fair amount of credit from um for, for playing Darth Vader and things. And obviously there is something to be said about how one has to portray Vader in a very specific way with walking. And what I really hope the series would do is that it's going to redeem Hayden Christensen in the eyes of people who hated him in the prequels. Now, I loved Hayden Christensen in the prequels. I'm not saying he was the best actor in that at all. Attack of the Clones especially. Even Megan's pointed out that even you and McGregor was quite that's, weak that's, in that. That's but I point. blame George Lucas for that, not necessarily Hayden Christensen, because I've seen him in other stuff. He's great in Jumper. And I stand by, I think Hayden Christensen in Episode 3, for the most part did a good job. I just think the dialogue is what was weaker for it. That is a point that I was going to make, is that the dialogue in this series is really good. Like, because as Mike said, I like I love Ewan McGregor, and I think he's a fantastic actor, but in specifically episode two, I don't think he's very good. And it's not because of him, because again, I know that he's a good actor, it's because of the dialogue. So I hope that, like, people kind of, 
because I'm, I mean, I, I, I don't like Anakin. I think he's a whiny bitch, and like I, you've seen Clone I Wars. jest, but I have seen Clone Wars, and since Clone Wars, it has added more depth to the character, and I do much prefer the character of Anakin since they've given that additional content. But I'm hoping that people are going to throw out less hate because people are dicks. So like, it will be nice. Like, we were watching some of the Star Wars Celebration stuff and you could see how overwhelmed Hayden Christensen was when he was coming out on stage and people were cheering him because he's been slated. Like, he's never had that. He's never had it because, obviously, all of the information that they saw, like, they said that this is... The, the prequels were predominantly aimed at kids. Mm. So they didn't get that content from people who were the demographic that were actually watching it. And, and like, oops, sorry. <laughs> like, we were the demographic. Like, when I, like, less so now, but when I think of Star Wars, I think of episode one. I think of the pod racing, because that's what I grew up with. So it's our generation that are now adults that are going to be watching this being like, oh, my God, yeah, Hayden Christensen, woohoo, where he hasn't really experienced that. So it's really nice that there's going to be some, like, bigging up for... Hayden Christensen and less of the hate, hopefully. Well, because I, I was like, I've, as I said, I've never had a problem with Hayden, but like, I watched, um, quite I mean, a lot of the fucking pear scene. The pear scene's lame, but once again, that's not his fault. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So sorry, Mike. I know you're talking, Go but ahead. I have to jump in. I am a huge defender of Hayden Christensen. I think he's been done hugely wrong by George Lucas and how he was directed. I mean, even Natalie Portman sucked in those films. She oh, is. Yeah. A wonderful actress but she she's when she doesn't have a great director she's not great you know because those relationships are mutual they they should be respectful and it brings out the best performance it brings out the best performance from the director that's my hot take um but Hayden Christensen I I cannot stand the hate that he got for the prequels young actor coming in huge role on his shoulders exactly the same in what happened in uh, with Daisy Ridley, um, you know, it, it, history repeated itself as of course it did because we because we never learn from anything, you know. And he's come into this huge franchise that's absolutely beloved, huge director, huge. Stars. Imagine being opposite Natalie Portman and Ewan McGregor for like almost the entire time. Ian McDermott before in the entire time you're on screen, right? And Samuel Jackson as well. Samuel and Jackson, Frank right? Oz obviously voicing and Yoda, like all these big yeah. actors is incredible. And if you look at what he's done before, he's done hardly anything. And then between um episode two and then uh episode three, he does Shattered Glass, which he is fantastic in. It's not a great film, but his performance is absolutely amazing. And then everybody just ripped him apart and he didn't have a chance to do anything else. Like what? Who was ever going to back somebody who Star Wars fans, like the biggest fandom basically in the world, says is shit? They basically ruined his career, and he didn't even get to start his career. Like he didn't get to learn. He didn't get to become a better actor. We forgive the older actors. We forgive Robert De Niro's, Al Pacino's, blur, even though they're both shit now. You know, we forgive them for their shit initial performances. All we remember is their great performances, and he never got that chance. I'm never going to say he's going to be up there in the pin pinnacle of acting. He's never going to be a bloody Tilda Swinton, like the best actor ever. He's never going to be there, is he? Because, you know, not everybody gets to be. Or a Brad Pitt, right? Because he's, he's as handsome, almost as Brad Pitt, right? Isn't he? But he was never going to get there. Cause he never, you know, anyway, because he's not that. Moving on. I'm on a rant now, I can tell. <laughs> Um, but what you should read is where I'm getting to is there's an amazing, he's done loads of interviews for this. There's an amazing Guardian article that came out last weekend, I think, where he talks about, you know, how he was young. He's come into this franchise. George Lucas was more a friend to him. George Lucas wasn't a director to him. He was a friend. George Lucas was his boss. He should have been directing him. He's not there to be your buddy, not giving him the opportunities. And then how he didn't go to cons because he was like scared and overwhelmed by the reaction. And exactly what Megan's saying, he's now going there and he's finally finding his feet with the fandom. He never left the fandom. The fandom left him. And I'm just like, isn't that amazing that he's willing to come back into this franchise? Because I wouldn't. I'd be like, oh, fuck you. You were mean to me. Like if they're one of my old jobs where they were mean to me, asked me to come back, I'd say, no, fuck off. You were horrible. Why would I? And he's and like that's my rant over. I don't know where it's going. <laughs> I got I think having the, the hate for the sequels has made people love the prequels more. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Insightful, thank you. I think that's definitely helped him. And and I completely agree, he didn't deserve that as a young man who's just given this this job 
that we would all fall over ourselves to get and you know to get the the vitriol that he got was completely unfair but i, I so i'm glad it's come around for him he's still he's still young you know prime of his life so you know he's still got plenty of time to to do plenty more roles so hopefully you know after this it, it'll it'll resurrect that acting career when i, I heard think... sorry, sorry I... go ahead no, 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 you go ahead. I'm going to go off on a massive one. So go ahead, Chris. No, no, I, I didn't realise, because obviously I'm not that into this. I mean, I love the films. I didn't realise he got so much hate. All the stuff you talked about, though, reminds me, as you know, I'm a massive gamer, is the stupid Xbox, PlayStation fanboy shit that I see every day because I go on all the forums. It's probably the same as you with the Star Wars stuff. I'm on every game inside, Twitter, everything, and it's just like pure shit, basically. And people yeah. just get hounded. And I know it's not a film, but it just annoys me when you say that you you like every console oh no 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 you can't do that like there's a state of play on at 11 o'clock that i'm going to watch for the playstation tonight and it's going to have all the games on everything it's so fucking toxic they just drive people out because like they call playstation fans ponies and then you've got the xbox and all this and i'm just sort of in the middle like i don't give a fuck but people are just so passive like football tribalism Obviously, Dave supports a shit 40 team. I support a good one. And uh, you get the tribalism. So it's like, you know, you do you do have that, you know, where you're so blinded by your own team or your, your own love for that team. You will back, back it up completely. I don't I don't get it. I didn't think he was that bad in, in, in the movies, the second and third ones, to be honest, even though I don't think the second one's a great film. I still watchable but i was more annoyed with the little fucking anakin in the first one he got me pissing nerves but i wouldn't hunt him down these people are idiots my biggest bugbear with star wars is harrison ford because he's a fucking cock who <laughs> when he the franchise, his interviews it's the worst off. why did you come back to force awakens the money yeah. well fuck you harrison yeah, ford we know how much you're getting paid he is, he's such, a, paycheck, he is yeah. he's such an arrogant <laughs> cock it's like oh i'll play on solo again well don't fucking bother mate we'll just kill you off if you want your cock <laughs> well, so he, want, he wanted to be killed he wanted to be killed off in the original in he didn't six. make any dead yeah. in the original ones he wanted to be killed. he's so fucking arrogant and i've said it once i'll say it again i'm going to get shit for this he's fucking one-dimensional actor who plays the same guy in every film fucking raise a lost art load of shit all of them he's a cock and that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> like Han Solo or nobody. Fucking clear and present danger, Han Solo. Same character, fugitive, Han Solo. You're not Dr. Richard Kimball, whatever your name is. Air you Force just, One. Air Force One. You're an arrogant wanker. So there you go. Anyway, so he's my problem with Star Wars, but I wouldn't hound him out of it. Not that he'd give a shit about me. So yeah, that's me setting on a bit of a rant there. Harrison Ford. <laughs> He's a cock. <laughs> right, well, this isn't the Harrison Ford slagging show. This is the defending uh, Hayden Christensen. Hayden. But I, I would say when I first heard that Christensen was involved in Kenobi, my first thought was, and I said this to Megan, I was like, I hope he gets enough screen time and enough to do that it redeems him. Because I, it makes me, like, I was getting quite emotional. I was watching a lot of the Star Wars Celebration coverage because you can watch it live on uh, on YouTube. And, you know, Megan goes to bed a couple hours before me. Normally I'll read Star Wars books or comics Yeah, or I got the joy of Mike watching it all by himself and then him showing me the stuff the next day. So he got to see it twice and I had to watch it. We didn't have to watch you, you asked to watch certain parts, but there was a bit I mentioned to Megan and I was like, there's a bit that made me quite emotional, which was when Ewan McGregor and uh, Hayden Christensen come out. It's about 20 minutes long on the first day of Star Wars Celebration. I think it's four days long. And they come out and everyone's cheering for them and stuff. Yeah, hey, okay, cool. They're cheering, whatever. And then Hayden Christensen tries to talk about three times and he can't because people are cheering for him so much. And people were yelling out, going, you are my Anakin. We're so glad you're back. And yeah, you there was someone that was like, face. I loved you as Anakin. And you can see in his face, he's getting so emotional because he's never had that. He had it from 2005. Everyone's like, your shit, fuck off. We don't want you in Hollywood ever. Leave. He went off. He, I think he had a farm for like yeah. a decade. He, he just ranch, disappeared. Yeah. yeah, and he was just gone. And he talks now when you, like when he first got um, the role for Star Wars, he was so excited. He was like with a roommate of his in I think LA or something. And he they got their like uh, toilet tables and were like fighting and stuff. And he was so excited. And then George Lucas, I, I don't blame George Lucas. It wasn't intentional. But George Lucas basically fucked him over by not providing enough direction. Yeah. George Lucas is still held in high regard by everyone in the Star Wars community and out of it. Hayden Christensen, as well as Ahmed Best, who played Jar Jar Binks, and Jake Lloyd, who played Young, Young Anakin, they all got fucked over by George Lucas's lack of proper dialogue and poor direction in certain elements. They got all the brunt, but George Lucas was like, oh no, George Lucas is still great because he made the originals. It's like, yes, he made the original A New Hope 
kind of by himself. Obviously, he had a lot of help from, I think, his wife at the time and other individuals. But then Empire and Return of the Jedi were directed by other people. He is a genius who created the universe, but he tried to make the prequels all by himself, and he fucked a lot of things up. And it saddened me so much of knowing that Hayden Christensen and the other actors, like Ahmed Best is a similar one who played Jar Jar. He was literally, when he first went to a convention um, in recent years, because he's been doing uh, something called Jedi Temple Challenge, which is like a kid's uh, Star Wars show. They do like obstacle courses and other stuff. It's all Star Wars themed. And he plays a Jedi in that. And he went to a celebration and there was something, and this is paraphrasing, but there was something he got interviewed on after he went to a Star Wars celebration. Everyone cheered for him. And he said... I thought when I came out, they were going to boo me off stage. And you're like, could you imagine being someone who's that integral to Star Wars, regardless of how much you do uh, dislike or like Jar Jar? And I hate Jar Jar, to clarify. I don't hate our man best. He did a great job. Yeah. He played a character that's so annoying. I hate him. As a as child, a I love Jar Jar. Yeah. But that's who Jar Jar's aimed for. Well, He's Chris, aimed for children. Our friend Chris Brayton of uh, the I Like to Like Things podcast has been on Genuine Chit Chat a few times. His girls loved Jar Jar. They're one of his fa- their favourite parts about the, the Phantom Menace. So Lucas su- succeeded in that realm. But the fact that Ahmed Best didn't eat, like, and Hayden Christensen don't go to conventions or didn't because they thought everyone would hate them and boo them off stage. It it makes me just want to both simultaneously cry and just punch the world. It was so upsetting to me, and it was so emotional. I, I say to anyone, check out uh, Star Wars Celebration Day One. Um, I think you can. It's like twenty minutes long of Obi Wan and uh, Hayden Christian. Uh, sorry, Ewan <laughs> McGregor and Hayden Christensen chatting for twenty minutes, and also all their answers are pithy non-answers because it was before the show release, so you can't hear anything interesting. But seeing Hayden's reaction and seeing you can see it in his face how emotional he's getting of people cheering for him. I just think. I'm so happy if obviously I'm happy for the show, but if not anything else, I'm just happy he's finally getting that. And so is Ahmed Best and things. They're finally having the fans like myself who love them for what they did. It just, it makes me happy. We're finally getting there. And I'm so glad Kenobi could be the vessel to do that. Um, so that was a very long tangent of me talking for a long time. So apologies, guys. Let's get on to the final parts of this so we can wrap this up. So I was going to say, I think, just pr- either predictions or what people want from the show or things like that. I'm going to say my prediction. I said that at the st- I think in the last episode, our last episode. I think Qui Gon Jinn, played by um, Liam Neeson, who's been confirmed in another show, Tales of the Jedi, which I'll tackle on the show at some point. But um, Liam Neeson, I'm certain, is going to be in it because he keeps mentioning Qui Gon, and in the books and other elements, Qui Gon and Obi Wan did speak uh, before New Hope when he was a, a Force ghost and things. And so my thought is either Qui-Gon's going to pop up in the next episode, give him a nice good old talking to, and then everyone's going to go out and fight Vader, or Qui-Gon's not going to appear till the very last episode, and the last thing we see is a nice closure and conversation between um, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon. And also there's a line in uh, uh, A New Hope, which is when, when we last spoke, you know, I was but a student and you were the master sort of thing. And so I think Obi-Wan is probably going to beat Anakin or beat Vader using the Force in some ridiculous, cool way, I hope. And he's probably going to somewhat fake his own death, which I think is what's going to make the rest of the galaxy kind of back off from him. And what I want, which I hugely doubt is going to happen, is Obi-Wan uses a force to pull Vader apart, pull his mechanical limbs off him and his mask off him and pulls him apart and leaves him there. Because that's the only way I can really see anyone beating Vader, is taking his his breathing apparatus away from him. And that would mean that Vader's comments on, I was but, uh, you know, you were the master when we last met, etc., etc. I think that's the only way it could really work in the canon. Um, Megan, what do you think of any predictions, what you kind of want from this, and we'll go around the table before we finish up? I don't know, really. Uh, Is there you want? Obviously, well, I want, I want, to, I want to see but... more Vader. Yeah. I, I want to see... <laughs> there's some more stuff there um i don't i, I hate it i hate it. I, I don't i don't fucking know i mean put me I, on like, the spot. I like you did, it you did agree to come on the podcast i did agree to, to come on the podcast <laughs> it's more that i just don't want to be by myself <laughs> <laughs> you just want avria telling you how great you are just i am i am fantastic <laughs> um yeah I, I don't really know to be honest i i want to see obi-wan kind of like come out of his shell a bit more obviously he's a bit scared of the force, I Obi guess. Raisin. Uh, what? Obi Raisin. Because you compared to oh, yeah, like a little, great, yeah. to little prune. Um, yeah, I want him to kind of come out of his shell a bit more and be like the Obi Wan that we like know and love. Because at the moment, he's obviously like hidden himself away from the force a bit. Yeah. 
So I think that will be cool. I'm kind of like, as much as I like the layer stuff, I don't just want it to be layer stuff. Yeah. Like, I kind of want her to to go now, go back to Alderaan, and then that be the end of it. But yeah, I agree. Um, we kind yeah. of, well, I think it's run its course. I think yeah. that maybe the next episode, if it's just like, well, oh, it has Leia to be some home. sort of resolution. We have to see Leia get home. Otherwise, it's just kind of like, oh, did she get back? Well, obviously, we know because she's an adult in a new home. <laughs> um, but yeah, there we go. Yeah, I do hope that the Leia stuff, I hope she kind of maybe gets home in the next episode or so. But I will say, I can't remember if I mentioned it in our discussion last week, but of all the reasons for Obi Wan to leave uh, Luke on Tatooine, I think them choosing in the writing to have Leia. I didn't even think of that option. I think that's such a clever idea of all the options. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so let's go to Dave first. Dave, predictions, thoughts, wants, any sort of final thoughts on the show and where it's going uh, before we wrap this up? Yeah, so I, I, with my Monty Python reference, I think I put out there what I where I want it to go. And and that's not too dissimilar to yours. I mean, yeah. if he if he kind of pulls apart his mechanics and everything, that, that would work as well. He'd still have that black knight look um i uh, yeah we're definitely going to see qui-gon jinn aren't we and i actually want to see obi-wan call that motherfucker out because it's like you told me to train this fucking space hitler <laughs> <laughs> and he was supposed to be bring balance to the force but you know the jedi were on mass and the sith were you know just in the shadows and now you know, you have brought balance, but not in the way you you sold it to me. So, yeah, I think wh- whether it's um, Liam Neeson coming in or not, you know, I, I think there's going to be something there, isn't there? They they keep referencing him, reminding the audience, you know, that uh, Qui Gon Jim was was his previous master. So, yeah, again, I I just hope that this joins up, and I I wonder where Reaver's character is going to go. You know, obviously, it's got all of the right wing tits in uh, in the US all going nuts and stuff, calling it woke and what whatnot. So, I, I really hope she has a prominent role that yeah. comes into it. I think the Grand Inquisitor, he's got to come back because we know he's in Rebels. Uh, yes, you're right. The clone technology is there, so I guess that could come into play. Um, but you know what? This episode has me thirsting. I, I'm so happy. I'm so joyous that we've got this Kenobi uh, series. But by Christ, I just want to see a Darth Vader series. Yes. I just want to see him, you know, go from Revenge of the Sith, uh, you know, just being encased in this mechanical suit to becoming the Darth Vader we see in Rogue One. I, I, I would pay good money for that. But um, yeah, So, uh, but they've only got three episodes to uh, wrap all of that up. So probably Qui-Gon Jinn, Kenobi figuring out how he can become a force ghost because that has got to be a thing because right now he doesn't. And Yoda's like, Kenobi, you had one fucking job. <laughs> this, I told you this at the end of Revenge of the Sith. That was the one thing I asked you to do. And you just, you know, living off a bit of whale meat. So, yeah, I, I think he, he's got to learn that lesson from Qui-Gon Jinn. And also, you know, do his uh, Rocky Four montage on, on Hoth. Nice. Rhea? Uh, yeah, I've just realised I'm sat in the dark, like a very <laughs> middling handheld horror film. Um, <laughs> camera horror film. Yeah. Uh, so I was slightly distracted by that. But yes, I agree. I think we need more Reva 100%. I think she's an absolute standout in this and such an interesting character. And anything to do with the wider law of the Inquisitors, I'm 100% in for. Um, so more, please. I think they need to really wrap up the layer stuff. I think it's been really nice, but let's not drag it out. We know, as, as Megan so succinctly put it, we know she's alive. Let's move on. Um, <laughs> it's like the cliffhanger on this episode did annoy me slightly. I was like, come on. Um, but I guess it is interesting how she's going to, how they're going to get out of this pickle. Um, I love the idea of unmasking Vader somewhat so we get more Anakin, so we can sort of feel Obi Wan's arc a bit more for when it gets to New Hope and a bit more of the 
so if I, you know I really I'm really loving this idea of he's sequestered himself away to find to figure out how to talk to force ghosts to figure out how to become more at one with the force as well I think that's really nice idea um but yeah there's a lot to do I think in just three episodes but I'm looking forward to it let's let's get cracking on to next week please not only because we will have carpet in most of the house but you know <laughs> new episode yeah, we're in a similar boat, you know. You and I have both moved. I know Dave is in the process of doing that sort of thing as well. So it's just Chris. Chris, you need to move just so we can all <laughs> oh, no, you know, no. be the moving gang. <laughs> and then we can all meet up again at the end with our feet all warm and toasty and nice carpets and have fun chats about it. Well, well exactly. my house looks tidy, but this room behind me, the living room, Sam decided she wanted it plastered about two months ago. So it's been plastered, painted. I've had the telly, three different stages on the wall. We do <laughs> fuck all. This room's, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I've done all of it. I usually do all the building, decorating everything. I've not done the plastering, but I've, I've had to redecorate. Even we paid someone to decorate because I can be shoulders balls up. But um, yeah, I put the telly on the wall. Oh yeah, it's shoulder from all that wanking, isn't it? Yeah. No, this is my lemon. <laughs> this is my lemon. Right oh, okay. you've no, been no, he uses, it up. Uh, he no, uses the left when he wanks that. over Spider Man only. <laughs> <laughs> he, he wears the Spider Man glove specifically when he does that. No, I, I was can't just feel wondering. Did, them were you wearing? Your shades when you fell asleep in the sun today. Yes, it was, David. You got a whole like <laughs> negative <laughs> panda. This is the thing. Go on the genuine chit chat YouTube, guys. You get to see you get to see Chris's Darth Vader helmet yes. and his talent and Rhea sat in almost pitch black darkness. Hey, no, Rhea's Darth Vader Vader helmet, the dark in about twenty minutes. We're going to be in darkness Rhea's as well. Rhea's so. playing the Riddler out of Batman. <laughs> 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 well, go on, Chris. Tell us what you what you want from the series going forward. Predictions and stuff. Well, I think after having watched and really enjoying the uh, multitude of madness, whatever it's called, Doctor Strange, which I thought was excellent, and even though I'm a shit house horror fan, I don't like him because I'm scared. Uh, I thought it was a great movie, but with the multiverse opening, I think this is the ideal time for Tony Stark to come back and just take out Darth Vader. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> In three years, I'm not happy. He could take him on, definitely. But anyway, stop being a bell and Chris. But um, <laughs> no, I think that we do need some sort of training montage. There's still a few holes in Obi Wan, which I'm not happy with. Uh, Qui Gon might do the business. We're probably going to see Darth Vader completely ignore the fact that R2D2 was his droid and he don't know who the fuck it is. And C3PO, what he's I've got a comment there. on that, but I'll come back yeah. to that when you're done. He's going to turn up as well somewhere. Andy Daniels is going to be there in the he background. He was, he was in episode mm-hmm. one. Oh, right. That there was a cameo of him, and he was played by... It was when um, you saw Leia in Alderaan for the first time, and you oh, saw right. uh, 3P in the background. He said, like, one thing, and then a silver version in of the protocol. In episode Pro- one? In the part one of oh, the Obi-Wan show. Oh, in the town. Oh. Yes, you're right. Yeah. In the town when you said episode realize, one, yes. I thought you meant the Phantom Menace I mean, then. I mean, 3P is in the Phantom Menace. No, I know he is. Him, I just but... got confused. <laughs> <laughs> episode one of the series. Keep up. Yeah, sorry, Chris. Sorry. Yeah, so, so, I think that... I think we're going to get something. Um, Darth Vader... Has got to have a, a fight against him, unless he doesn't, and and Obi Wan just is an absolute shit house. And the whole point of the Jedi is again just to be cowards and not run and leg it. Sorry, so I want him to give it him back. I want him. I wasn't happy with the way Darth Vader picked up Obi Wan and just took him out like he was a soldier. You know, when he picked him in the air and he had the lightsabers, and he went, "I tell you what, I'm just going to ch- choke, fucking do you." Not happy about that. Obi Wan should have fought back on that. So that I was a bit. Um, ha- thing I did like the fact that he got burnt and everything, like you say, you said before, Mike. Once again, that like, was really messed up, was it? And that was a quite an yeah. adult moment watching it. Just when yes. we watched that as well, we were like, "Is this really happening?" Like you were just watching, it, like you McGregor yes. screaming in fire it's after brilliant. watching some kid have his neck snapped. You're like, "This is still a twelve, right? Yeah. This is still a kid." <laughs> and I was like, "Obi Wan doesn't die because we know this, but it yeah. really seems like he's about to die, and that's very rare in a film or TV show where you know that the protagonist is going to live." And I like how they burnt his arm because you never see Ben Ooh. Kenobi's no, you skin don't. underneath yeah. so I was like that was a very clever idea as long as his face keeps intact they can do what they want to his limbs can't they exactly and you're, and you're right both of you are totally right because I was the same And but I think knowing Disney and knowing the way this is going to go this is probably the most gruesome part of the series that we've seen we're going to see Han Solo bump into Leia at some point who's going to look at her when he's about 15 and go, I'm going to marry that six-year-old really child. Um, <laughs> and we're going to see the Millennium Falcon come in and take Darth Vader out, who he doesn't even know the <laughs> ship is again. Uh, we're going to have all these callbacks and it's going to ruin these first three episodes. There's going to be some nonsense that Disney are going to throw in there because I love the darkness and the, no. s- the nastiness of what they've done so far. I love that he's a bastard 
and we hate him and we want him. We know he's not going to get his comeuppance, but we want some sort of redemption. So that nine-year gap when Obi-Wan ages by 20 years because he becomes <laughs> Alec Guinness, um, he's going to be justified in this. But I just think there's going to be some nonsense Chewbacca fucking... You know, there's going to be some Millennium Falcon reference there and Han Solo's going to walk past her and go, hey, kid, there's some fucking stupid thing as he's nicking something off Jabba the Hutt or something when he's about 15, but there you go. Well, he's probably not 15 at this point, is he? He's probably about 20-odd. Well, is this I not think, around the timeline of Solo, um, then? In, in well, it's, it's set kind of before and after Solo. I think at this point yeah. in the timeline, uh, Solo is off fighting in the War of Mimban stuff, which is right. that time jump you see in Solo. But obviously Han Solo is about... 10 ish years older than Leia and Luke at so the time of the new He's home. about 20 then in this. So he, yeah, it's going to be creepy, right. but yeah, it, it, there's going to be some weirdness going on. I think this could be the peak, which I really hope it's not, but I've got a feeling this might be the peak of the series, knowing them clowns at Disney and they'll fucking ruin it. Now, if there's going to be a cameo, it's going to be Ahsoka Tano or Grogu or something like that. Be- it's going to be a. I think there's yeah. going to be a flashback episode, probably over the fifth. I think the fifth episode. What we're going to do? We're going to see the the or, true origin of uh, Reva, because obviously we saw her as a youngling in the, yeah. which I loved the Order sixty six montage at the start of the poem. But I talked about that in our last episode. But I I love that. But I think we're going to get a flashback episode part. We're going to get Hayden Christensen as Anakin wearing Clone Wars armor with a young Ahsoka and Obi Wan. Oh, that would be so fun! I would cool. love that. But also that will be a soft little thing of like, oh, the Ahsoka series. Come on, people who don't watch Clone Wars, yes. Chris, um, you know, make sure you go and check that out. Um, but also with, um, I think the the light thing for this, I think it's more likely it's trying to push for the Andor series that's coming out in August because Jimmy Smith, who plays Bail Organa, obviously Mon Mothma is probably going to pop up again. The, the Andor series is a prequel to Rogue One. And in that, you know, Bail Organa does appear. So I think, I'm hoping Disney are kind of using... Bail Organa in this as the ca- the cameo in a sense apart from the flashback I hope for I- I'm thinking that hopefully they're just kind of pushing hey Bail Organa you know him that guy who's actually quite minor in the movies but behind the scenes he's really major he's going to be in the Andor series let's make you watch that in a couple months but you know Disney do like to throw cameos out a lot I suppose we, we, we can't have a full episode though like Boba Fett where the Mandalorian was the best part of the whole series <laughs> can you imagine that <laughs> next week not do it's that, just Mike. a Mando episode yeah, it's, a Mando. <laughs> it's another one it's a Mando. me Grogu no, it's, <laughs> me Grogu it's a Mando episode it's another one where episode 5 of Kenobi is Mandalorian just him training to become about yeah. <laughs> could you imagine the outrage <laughs> yeah but then, then it's even better than the show like the fucking book of Boba Fett oh, Mike yeah. don't do that to me I'm so <laughs> Well, Book of Boba Fett is almost like, to me, what Miles Morales, Spider-Man Miles Morales was, because yes. Miles Morales was meant to be a downloadable content pack for Spider-Man, and it got so big, they're like, let's release this as a full game, even though it's only about six hours long, and even though I love the game itself. And Book of Boba Fett felt like that. I was like, hey, here's a one-off special episode about Boba Fett, and they're like, we could make a whole series out of this. And you're like, can you, though? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, it doesn't really work. Oh, let's come chuck in Mandalorian into this, and it makes it work. It does yeah, really. Yeah, you get to see Danny Trejo, and that's all that matters. I mean, Danny Trejo's great in anything. I love him. Um, yeah. But sorry, Chris, do you have anything else to say? Because we kind of cut you off there no, no, a little bit. No, no, no. no. Okay. I think um, we're there. Absolutely stellar. Well, um, thank you all of you um, for joining us for this uh, Kenobi. The audience and also the lovely guests as well uh, for this Kenobi discussion. So we'll um, we'll finish this off by doing the plugs so we'll talk about where people can find us let's use Megan because she's the busiest podcaster in the world how do people find you I have a podcast don't forget to mention the paywall oh I have a podcast it's called Patreon <laughs> it's um, an afterthought really you have to pay you have to pay to, to hear me talk and sometimes sing if you, you so do, desire in the Les Miserables episode well, after <laughs> it was a fair Miser- amount of singing yeah um, yeah that's where you can find me also on Instagram but to be honest I haven't posted on there in like a month. So it's probably not even worth following me there, to be honest. It's follow so. me. Follow Genuine Chit Chat on Instagram. Check my stories every day. Yeah, you, and can, you, you, might can, see you can find me on again. Genuine Chit Chat. <laughs> yeah, great. Awesome. Um, cool. Um, so, uh, Chris, what about yourself? Where can people find you? What are people uh, going to want to... How are they going to find you, Chris? Well, well obviously, I'm going to cross over with uh, my great friend, Mr. Dave Horrocks, situated my bottom left on my screen. Oh, he's our about? bottom left as well. He's, oh, yeah. yes. Yeah, bottom left. So uh, <laughs> we do um, the VHS strike. Dave, I'll let you do the comics one, Dave, and I, but we do the VHS strikes back. So if you want to find us on there where we review 
all sorts of uh, great movies and a lot of nonsense. And we've got a lot of nonsense coming up because <laughs> I am stitching Dave up, but he's stitching me up in the next few weeks. We've got stuff planned to do each other. Um, that sounds so wrong. But then also... <laughs> <laughs> That, that's VHS Strikes Back after dark. After dark. <laughs> you know what? I was just reading an article on Baywatch at nights, so whatever it was called, and how weird that show was today. I don't know why, because I've been watching Pam and Tommy, so I've gone down a rabbit hole of reading everything about oh, how weird. So good, that series. Oh, brilliant. Well, the Pistols one's on now on Net Disney, so I've got to watch that. The Sex Pistols one's just come on. So um, the, so anyway, yeah, we're on that. But get over to the reality show, which me and Dave do, which is Chris and Dave's reality cast, or CD reality cast, which you didn't realise it says CD, and it's not, it's C and D for our initials, but everyone calls us CD because we're two middle-aged men who watch reality <laughs> And uh, Love Island starts Monday, people, so what excuse have you got? <laughs> Anything on the planet. Oh, here's the excuse. Kenobi, Ms. Marvel that's coming out, Stranger Things, my podcast. Many reasons to not watch Live Island, friends. <laughs> Even though I'm in the minority here, because I'm the only person here who doesn't really watch it. <laughs> but um, we'll carry that on with Dave. Then you can continue the uh, the amazing duo of podcasting that you both are. So I will say that uh, for the VHS strikes back just this very evening, because Chris and I bounce between ourselves what we're going to choose. And, you know, Chris generally goes before me. We also let our patrons pick as well. But, you know, when Chris and I pick, we sometimes we pick something we love. Sometimes we just want to stitch each other up. And, and Chris hates, apart from Star Wars and stuff, he hates that space-based sci-fi. And I've picked out one of the rip-offs because the original Star Wars came out, you know, 77, and there were so many rip-offs. And there was a Roger Corman movie called Battle Beyond the Stars, which is, uh, it's got so many, <laughs> so many characters in there. Uh, you got uh, Roger Vaughn from uh, Superman 3. Uh, you've got George Peppard from the original A team. It's horrendous. So Chris is going to absolutely fucking hate it, and that gives me so much joy. Uh, so <laughs> definitely look out for that. But before that, Chris has picked out a horrendous martial arts movie for me to watch. So yeah, VHS Strikes Back, where we, where Chris and I just have so much fun stitching each other up, and uh, we'll also be doing a bunch of other stuff. But that's the one I'll highlight today. Perfect. And then, Rhea, tell everyone what you're up to. Well, clearly, I have turned into Pazuzu, so you can find me in The Exorcist. That's where I'll be going. <laughs> Everybody. Or The Ring, maybe. Yeah, Jesus, what's Blair going Witch on here? Project. Oh, yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> Did you see the photo of what we found behind our fireplace? That's full-on Blair Witch. Maybe I'm possessed. Anyway. Um... <laughs> Who's that stuff behind you? <laughs> <laughs> just camera goes off yeah. okay oh, oh, I wish I'd host. Done that now. have you watched host yes yes oh, it's so good so it's just good. like this <laughs> just like that, just like that. <laughs> well you're all going to feel bad if you don't hear from me on discord tomorrow now aren't you because i've been yep. murdered because of you in my weird country house <laughs> yeah don't oh, say that <laughs> 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 um, God, I can't even remember what we're doing now. Um, You're promoting Fairmont. yourself. Yes, thank you. Femme on Film, go find me on Twitter at Femme on Film and on Comics in Motion, Indie Comics Spotlight with the wonderful Tony Farina. And I'm also a pop gorilla at Pop Gorilla, spelt like the uh, organization. Tactic. Yeah. The war war tactic, gorilla. Yeah, <laughs> Where we <laughs> like. <laughs> Not the analyst, like gorillas but, in the uh, mist. I'll yeah. put a link in the description to everyone's <laughs> yeah, okay, links just okay. so people don't get too complicated, including yeah. Megan's Instagram that I make her always lovely. <laughs> and I'll send you a link to that Guardian article if you could put that in as well. Yeah, That'd yeah, please lovely. do. And send it to me as soon as possible because I'll forget. Yeah, I'll do it now. <laughs> and at Rhea Carrigan, that's where you can go find me. Talk and also, you. you did a little, uh, this is a plug for myself and for you, and I'm the last person talking, so I get to spend the next 20 minutes talking about myself. <laughs> um, well, you, you know, I had uh, someone called um, Alison Shelton on Genuine Chit Chat oh, yes. a while ago, and she was absolutely incredible. I was introduced to her through Tonya Todd, who is one of the um, extended family of Comics in Motion, who is delightful. And I think that she's going to be doing uh, the Ms. Marvel crossover thing that yourselves are going to be doing. Not dissimilar to this, but slightly worse. But um, it's, sorry. Fuck off. No. <laughs> Oh my, that's terrible. Uh, I know it's. It, I mean, I I know nothing about Miss Marvel. Let's so. remember what I called you at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Um, First so, Muslim superhero, so female, 
Yeah. It is a landmark series. Is. Everyone needs to watch it. 100%. Yes. And I know that Tony is a massive fan of Ms. Marvel, the comics. I think, Rhea, I think you are um, as well. I've never even, before the Ms. Marvel trip was announced, I didn't actually know who she was in any way, shape, or form. Boo. So, yeah, I know. I'm terrible. I've got too many Star Wars comics to read to spend oh, my time reading I'm everything gonna, else. I'm not going to give up my white man hobby. To yes. No, I'm not Rhea. <laughs> no. Ooh. I mean, yeah. Um, anyway. Um, but That's because, the only reason we bought a house. Well, my, it's, it's a store of Mike's comic books. I don't have that many. There's only two comic bins so far that are like half full. Um, but basically, I spoke to Alison Shelton, who was amazing, but she recently... Uh, uh, made a comic book called Reburn mm. and on Indie Comic Spotlight I think the episode should be airing it's in, today it's today wonderful so it will be by the time this comes out that this episode will be out so first most importantly listen to my conversation with Alison Shelton on Genuine Chit Chat and then if you fancy it check out the conversation with her um, Rhea and Tony about the comic more specifically uh, Reburn it's absolutely fantastic she's a delight and I think she's been doing a lot of bits and pieces because obviously she was on Femme on Film as well yes exactly uh, with Rhea so yes. once people get in the comics and motion family once one of us gets our hooks into them we pull them into the darkness and they can't <laughs> escape like Hotel California <laughs> exactly that's it that's, everyone compares comics and motion to Hotel California that's the exact thing um <laughs> But you can find me at Genuine Chit Chat on Instagram, Twitter, and on Facebook. Obviously, I've got my show, Star Wars Comics in Canon. If you enjoy this conversation, there's no reason not to check it out. You've never have to have read a single Star Wars comic in your life, Chris. You've never even have to have read the ones I'm tackling, Chris, on this episode. All the Darth Vader comics that Dave mentioned, you know, the f- uh, four volumes of it, which talks about so Darth good. Vader straight after Revenge of the Sith. I go through the plot details, so you don't need to read the comic, Chris. And I go through the other many uh, relations to other Star Wars content, both both the movies and also other stuff is no excuse if you enjoy Star Wars to not check out Star Wars comics and canon and obviously I've got my other show Genuine Chit Chat where I've spoken to people involved in creating Star Wars Kevin Scott Claudia Gray Dominic Pace was in The Mandalorian and also lots of other interesting people Paolo Villanelli who's a comic book artist and I've got more to come as per usual but you can find all of us lovely people you know you can follow Comics in Motion on Instagram Twitter and on Facebook and you know follow all of us I'll put links in the description to all these lovely people but the best thing to do is subscribe to Comics in Motion listen to all the shows that all the people in this uh, conversation are involved in soon we're going to have the Ms. Marvel show running concurrently with the Kenobi show so you're going to get loads of these discussion shows as well as all the other shows like Indie Comics Spotlight Star Wars Comics and Canon we've got a new classic comics thing coming out soon as well with uh, Matt B. Lloyd loads of stuff to sink your, te- sink your teeth into regardless of how much you enjoy the fandom of nerdiness superheroes comics and all that stuff and you know please share on social media please rate and review on good pods apple Podcasts, all those usual places and please subscribe to both vhs strikes back and genuine chat chat on patreon but i will say the vhs strikes back patreon doesn't have megan so just gonna say that out there if you're gonna choose one yet she hasn't subscribed (laughs) (laughs) we will be there i'm just i'm not even gonna have my own podcast i'm just gonna like creep into everybody's patreons <laughs> i'm just gonna spread across the globe well I mean, have you seen top gun maverick she hasn't seen i haven't seen any of the top guns there's only ever top, i've not <laughs> buy it actually i've not seen the original top gun <laughs> Dave's face. What is wrong with you both? yeah a lot, a lot of people get really larry at me because i've not seen films to be fair the first one it doesn't hold up exactly how i thought but the new one it is brilliant fucking amazing I've heard the news I've heard really it's good. really good people at work were yelling like I obviously people know I'm a movie buff and I was like oh, yeah. they're like oh Mike have you seen Top Gun Maverick and I was like I haven't seen Top Gun the original and they're like movie what did you just say seen Top Gun yeah okay people take like you that, shame take me take that away you shame me okay <laughs> yeah. I had a discussion in discord and someone very nice it might have been Tony or Tonya said don't worry or moment Jack even be like don't worry, you call yourself a movie buff, you can't watch every movie that's really held in critical acclaim because there's only so much time in the world. You are shaming me, Rio. Yeah, I am. I'm talking to you right now <laughs> instead How of watching that movie. How does it feel, Mike? It makes me feel like that you're a see you next Tuesday. But I won't <laughs> call, I won't <laughs> call it... Oh, I, won't, I, I won't even have to try that hard. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, I will just jump in. I'm older than you, Mike, and to be fair, we reviewed it and that was the first time I watched it last year because I'd seen bits of it you know, obviously, I knew the song and the, the fucking the volley, the volleyball, volleyball scene, yeah, and all homoerotic that, volleyball, volleyball scene. Yeah, yeah I know about that. But I never watched it, and I didn't enjoy it. Me and Sam this week, we've just well, we, we one of our patrons, you know, Glenn Davis, he's decided that he wants to do Iron Eagle. So mm. what this is, God's honest truth. In the last three days, I watched 
Iron Eagle straight into Top Gun within in, within half an hour. So Top Gun, the original, was like a masterpiece compared to Iron Eagle, which is a load <laughs> of shit. And then I went to the cinema 12 hours later to watch Maverick. And Maverick, I mean, it doesn't matter if Mink Jordan watches, she's never seen Top Gun. She's about 20. What I said, I didn't know, but there's plenty of callbacks. You don't have to watch the first one, but you have to watch that in the cinema. It is one of the best films I've seen. for a The long action time. scenes are amazing. A, a, amazing. Yeah. And, and the thing is, it's like... It's like if you watch A New Hope, it alludes to all the history. And now, what you know, having watched all the prequels, you know what it, the history is. You see the history, yeah. but you don't need it. So you could just go and watch that, that movie. You could yeah. watch Top Gun Maverick without seeing the original. But um, for completeness... Which I know you are a completist, Mike. I do. So Any you excuse. have to watch the original. For Megan, it's like, oh, Megan, look, a new film is coming out in a franchise. You haven't seen the other three films. Guess what we're watching for the next week? <laughs> That's normally how I get her. And it's like, but Megan, we're doing a podcast about it. Didn't you remember like four months ago, You on off chance, I said to you when you're really tired, would you want to be involved in this podcast? <laughs> yeah. And you said, I guess you I will. Yeah, it's like do you remember that? Well, I do. So you have to watch all these movies now to get into it. Um, That's how it happened with Batman. That's how we did the Batman yeah. right. That's how we got you That's to watch- how we got me to watch all of the fucking Batman movies. <laughs> that was Scott more than me, to be fair. I hadn't even seen all of the Batman movies, but yeah, that was a slog. Um, but yeah, thank you, uh, as always, um, all three of you for joining me and Megan. Uh, it has been a delight chatting with you, and a couple of you are going to be popping up again in the future of this discussion show, and obviously Rhea is going to be taking the helm in the Ms. Marvel discussion show, so make sure you subscribe to Comics in Motion so you don't miss out on any of the great stuff. Don't forget, guys, if anyone is listening, if you subscribe, you don't have to listen to every single episode, but you'll be aware of all these amazing shows that we have on the network so please subscribe share with your friends tell everyone you've ever met about comics in motion and we'll all be very happy with you um but i'll include links in the description for all of these lovely people's social media and that sort of stuff and um, i think we'll talk to all of you very soon because obviously next week we've got another obi-wan discussion episode coming out with a few new faces so you know thanks guys we appreciate all of you and we'll speak to you all very soon thanks mike Thank you for the only Bye one now. thanking me. <laughs> <laughs> no one else. Everyone else like, fuck you, Mike. Fuck you, Mike. Mike. <laughs> May the force be with you. Oh, thank, thank you, sir. Beautiful. And with you. <laughs>